Let's hear a few verses from the beginning of chapter 10 of Romans. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. But their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end, the goal, the culmination of the Mosaic law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. This is a very interesting introduction to the middle of this long argument refuting the idea that God was finished with Judaism. He, in fact, is going to argue here in these verses that there are sort of two righteousnesses, if we can put it that way. There's a righteousness that comes from obedience and doing the works of the Mosaic Law, and then there is a righteousness that comes by another means, through faith in the faithful one, Jesus Christ, whom he's going to call later in this very same chapter, the righteousness or the faith, if you will, using a, a, a concept called personification, if you will. Christ is the righteousness of God embodied, uh, not only because he lived a sinless life, but also because he conveyed the very positive, holy character of God on earth, manifesting God's forgiveness and mercy and grace, but also his holiness and righteousness and justice. What he says about the Mosaic Law must be taken very seriously. Christ is the end of the Mosaic Law and that whole way of remaining in right standing with God. We are not called to keep the Mosaic Covenant any longer. This becomes confusing for Christians because, in fact, in plenty of places in Paul's letters, he gives us all kinds of commandments and imperatives that we as Christians are expected to keep. They're not the blessed options, they're actually commandments. So what gives here? Well, Paul, if you will, is the apostle of the New Covenant. And he's prepared to talk about the law of Christ as part of the New Covenant. So what is this law of Christ? The law of Christ is, first of all, portions of the Old Covenant that were reaffirmed by Jesus or Paul or other apostles. For example, thou shalt not commit adultery and thou shalt not kill, etc. But also, in addition to that, the law of Christ involves the Sermon on the Mount. In the chapters that follow this, in Romans 12 and 13 and 14 and 15, at various points Paul will allude to or paraphrase ideas from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and expound on them as a teaching that Christians should obey. But the law of Christ also seems to refer to the expansions on the Old Testament or on the teachings of Jesus um, that we may call apostolic commandments, if you will. So, is there law in the New Covenant? Absolutely. Paul is not contrasting grace versus law or works versus grace. He's contrasting the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant. And in both of these covenants, there is grace involved. And in both of these covenants, there is law involved as well. What Paul is saying in Romans 10, 4, and 5 is Christ is the end of the old law covenant, the Mosaic covenant, but now we're under the new covenant. Let's hear another little bit of this so we can understand uh, a little better. Paul, having spoken about election in chapter 9 and, uh, and foreknowledge and the corporate concept of election, then goes on in chapter 10 to talk about salvation. Listen to what he says about how people are saved. Paul says, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Notice he doesn't say, if God has chosen you before the foundation of the world, you'll be saved. That's not what election is about. The chosen people were chosen to be a light to a nation. They had a mission. They had a ministry. This was not a statement about individual persons' salvation. 
If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified or given right standing, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all those who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? For as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. People just like Paul, including Paul. So notice the chain of logic here. Preaching leads to hearing the good news, which leads to embracing the good news by grace through faith, which leads to being saved. This is how people are saved. And so right in the middle of the whole discussion of election and ministry and mission and the future of Israel, Paul makes crystal clear that the means of salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus. Then in chapter 11, he's going to go on and talk at some length about the future of Israel. What we really need to say about that, and the most important part, comes right at the end. So let me just read the very end. Paul says, Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. He's talking about Gentiles who have been grafted into the people of God. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Notice he, want, he warns the very Gentiles who are now Christians, who have been grafted into the people of God, into the Jewish root, like Paul and other Jewish Christians. He warns them they may yet be cut off if they are unfaithful. And if they do not perish, uh, persist in unbelief, the Jews themselves will be grafted back in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily would these natural olive branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be considered conceded. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this same manner, all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the Deliverer will come forth from heavenly Zion, and he will turn godlessness away from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins." In other words, Paul is talking about an eschatological miracle. When Christ returns, when the Redeemer comes from heavenly Zion, Israel that currently is hard-hearted or has rejected their Messiah will see him face to face and many of them will turn to him again. But the basis of their salvation will not be their previous election or being chosen by God to be the light of the world. The basis of their salvation will be by grace, through faith, due to the mercies of God when they embrace their Savior once and for all. This is a great mystery, says Paul, but I'm saying it refers to the future of Israel.